What I actually want to talk to you about is skulls, teeth, and adaptations that these animals have in order to survive really well out there in the bush. Good morning everyone, welcome back to another episode of Shimori TV. Now, what I want to talk to you about today doesn't look as bad as what I suppose it looks like from your side. What I actually want to talk to you about is skulls, teeth and adaptations that these animals have in order to survive really well out there in the bush. Now all of these skulls over here that I have have come from the reserve. Animals that we found that have died of natural causes and we've used them for educational purposes and training. So often when we're out in the bush, often what we find is just a fragment of bone or a fragment of skull or a partial something, whether it be a tooth, tusk or something like that. We've got to try and piece together the information. Often what we're able to do is look at a skull and figure out its ecological role just by looking at the physiological characteristics of the bone that we're seeing. A simple example is predator prey. Are the eyes on the side of the skull? In other words, trying to get a massive field of vision because your prey species are always wanting to see as much around them as possible. Or are the eyes pointing forward? In other words, your predator species, the eyes are situated at the front of the skull, so there's an overlap pattern of vision which creates binocular vision. It then enables them to judge distance really well. Let's take a look at this guy. This is a hippo. So this is quite a formidable animal at the best of times and you can see the size of this skull, the massive bulk that this animal is carrying around just in the head region. One of the most noticeable things that we can see apart from the mouth and teeth down below over here is how everything else, the sense orientated organs are all situated on top of the skull because of its aquatic lifestyle. The nostrils would be up over here, the eyes up over here and the ears over here. So everything on a level plane that they can go just above the surface of the water, get all the information that they need without having to expose themselves really badly. Let's have a look at some of the features that make hippo really, really powerful and adaptive creatures to what they do. We can see at the front over here, we have our incisors and they can be really, really long and sharp, sometimes about 40 centimeters. Then we have our canines out on the side over here and you can see that knife-like blade as those canines rub against one another. Here's an example of a canine that we picked up out in the bush. But look at that really, 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 really sharp edge over here. It's these weapons that the big bulls have that are so super sharp that they use for slashing and cutting when the bulls are fighting with one another over territory to hold the largest amount of females. And one of the things about herbivores is everything that they're doing is about processing food and grass, vegetation is all very, very difficult to break down and process. It's a tough food source. There are so many different protective elements on vegetation, whether it be thorns or woody material or hairs, all of that type of stuff is designed to make it difficult or prevent an animal from eating it and processing it. Now, one of the things that a hippo has is these molars at the back over here, which are really, really broad and really, really flat. And it's that surface area over there that will allow the movement of the hippo to be able to chew up that, uh, that grass material really, really well. So one of the key differences between herbivores and carnivores is herbivores' jaws often move laterally like that. They move sideways. And that's to aid grinding up vegetation, plant material. And often what we'll find is these large areas on the side over here that are all designed for muscle attachments. In this case, it's the mesotor muscle. And that allows for your sideways movement to help grinding up food. Now, this enlarged area you don't really find in carnivores that much because they don't grind their food. They bite and chew their food in an up and down motion. So they have another adaptation which helps bite force coming down uh, and not sideways. Another fantastic adaptation that hippos have is the ability to open their mouth really, really wide. They have a gape 
in some instances about 150 degrees, which is really, really wide. That gives them the ability to show off their weapons and obviously when they're fighting with one another, the ability to bite and, and use those canines to inflict a large amount of damage. They have a bite force of about 1,800 pounds per square inch. That's, that's enough to bite you in half. The next animal I want to show you is one of our predator species. And you can tell that really, really easily by these very, very long canines over here. And instead of having broad, flat molars and premolars, they've got cuspid, really, really sharp cutting teeth. And this feature over here, we'll have a look at it again for cheetah and for lions, is what we call a carnassial shear. It's unique to the, the carnivores and it's what gives them the cutting edge, literally, so to speak. So on this brown hyena over here, you can see there's a number of different features that make it slightly different from the herbivores. We've got the eye or orbital sockets at the front over here, which allow the animal to look forward, telling us it's a predator. They've got these really, really thick set and huge based canine teeth. And canines are obviously an adaptation to carnivores, the ability in a number of them to insert those canines to actually part vertebra in some animals to hold down and rip meat in other instances so really all adapted uh, around killing and eating meat and obviously that carnassial shear is just so effective we've got this very enlarged area over here called a zygomatic arch and that's all about muscle attachments you must remember a hyena has a massive massive bite force what these guys need to do is basically use their mouth like a nutcracker to be able to get into the marrow and the bone in a lot of the carcasses that they get into. So the bite force, the, the lever action that they have, and it's all assisted by muscle attachments. And the bulkier the muscle attachments are, the harder the bite force is gonna be. And that is why these skulls are just so robust. Hyenas have a bite force of about 1,100 pounds per square inch. That's only a few hundred pounds off of the hippo that we've just looked at. And you can see the size difference between a hippo and a hyena. So these guys are hugely powerful. Another adaptation to allow them to get to the marrow, the highly nutritious material on the inside of the bones that helps them to survive. It's their ability or their way of occupying a niche that other animals weren't. The next one I want to look at is rhinos. And one of the most noticeable things about rhinos is this area on the front of the nose over here. And that is the growth point of where the horns will grow out of. Now, unlike other bovid species, these guys don't have a central bony core covered by a keratin sheath. So this growth point is very similar to what you would find in the nail beds on your fingers and toes. It's basically an area where compressed hair grows from, and you can tell a rhino just by this long elongated face over here. There's no other ports where tusks or anything would go from on the side. And basically those two growth points for the horns over here. Now all rhino species, all living rhino species, or what we call extant living rhino species, all have growth points for horns coming off of the top of their face over here. Let's lift this up and have a look at the teeth that give these guys the winning edge when they're busy grazing. Just the, the absolute mass of the skull is phenomenal. Now if we have a look at the bottom jaw over here, if we have a look at these teeth over here, these molars and premolars, you can see how flat and broad they are. And it's this that gives them the ability to grind up and chew grass really well. And again, if we have a look, we have this massive region over here for muscle attachments to help with that sideways lateral movement to grind up uh, grass. So just holding this skull, I mean, it is, it is really, really heavy. And you can imagine all of the muscles needed on this rhino's neck and shoulders, the nuchal hump area, in order to support the weight of the skull. It really is dense, it really is heavy. So you can tell straight away that this is a carnivore skull. We've got eyes at the front, we've got canines, and we have a carnassial shear, but it's a tiny, dainty skull. This is from a cheetah. We can see it has a zygomatic arch. It has quite a decent sagittal crest over here. All muscle attachments that help with the bite force. 
But because cheetah don't rely on a bite force in order to survive, they rely on speed. They've got massive intake of air coming into them so that they can get the most amount of oxygen so that they can run really fast, catch the animal. They can use their bite force to suffocate the animal. But what cheetah do have that's really impressive is a phenomenally sharp and large surface area carnassial shear. That actually implies that cheetah rely on that carnassial shear more than lions, for example. Lions have the luxury of eating slowly because they can defend the kill. Whereas cheetah, they don't have that luxury. They need to eat as quickly as they can. So they have to process as much meat as possible to eat and then leave. So their carnassial shear is actually proportionately very large. It's a lightweight skull. Everything about the cheetah is adapted to making it lightweight so that it becomes as fast as possible. It would be pointless for a cheetah to be heavy and bulky because then it wouldn't be able to catch its prey. Now this is a skull from a young elephant. There is mortality in young animals, so you will find skulls and carcasses from young animals from time to time. It's not that uncommon. We can tell straight away it's an elephant because of those two big holes at the front over there. That's basically where the tusks would go into, and those are highly modified in sizes. Those are teeth. The one interesting thing about elephants is their teeth are replaced from the back and they move forward almost like a conveyor belt and they get replaced every few years until they wear down and as you can imagine elephants have got a really really tough diet they're breaking branches twigs leaves bark they eat grass but the teeth wear down at quite a heavy rate and it's that ability for elephants to replace the teeth by moving from the back forward in a number of sets throughout their life until eventually they've worn down completely they get about six sets of teeth throughout their life. For its size, it's not that heavy compared to the rhino. And we know that an elephant's skull is made up a lot of honeycomb pattern. It gives it strength, but it also makes it light enough to be able to adapt to the bulk and size of its skull. So comparatively, I mean, this guy is not as heavy as that rhino. We've obviously got these highly modified incisors at the front over here, and they grow the entire life of an elephant they'll be growing. It works out to about three millimeters per week that an elephant's tusk grows. But remember that the elephant is permanently wearing those tusks away by using them to dig with, to peel off bark, and it'll have a preference left or right tusk as well. So that's the highly modified incisors. And then we get to these diamond shaped ridges over here on these molars. And it's those diamond shaped ridges that help grind up the vegetation. On the African elephant, the ridges on, on top of the molars are diamond shaped. In Asian elephants, they're more oval shaped. And that's a difference between African elephants and Asian elephants. So the trunk basically starts forming over here. The muscles start increasing. And remember, the trunk is a fusion between the nose and the upper lip that fuse together and form the long trunk. This opening up over here is just part of the sinus cavities. A lot of the time when we hear elephants, the rumbling noise, it's not coming from their stomach. It's the last resonating frequencies within the sinus passages that now become audible to us. Now this is an impressive one. This is the king of the jungle. I showed you the cheetah, the canines, the incisors, the zygomatic arch, the sagittal crest, and this really impressive carnassial shear. But it's so light in comparison to this. And we can see just how huge that lion skull is and how impressive it is. So there we have our zygomatic arch. We've got our eye orbits at the front over here looking forward. We've got good air intake at the front over here. We've got a massive sagittal crest at the back over here for all these muscle attachments to be able to allow a massive bite force. And we can see this carnassial shear on the side over here, how those molars and premolars are acting like a, a pair of scissors so that a lion is able to bite on the side of its mouth to be able to shear through flesh and thick skin and hide to cut off chunks. So these incisors at the front over here aren't really used for cutting meat. It's more just for gnawing or pulling little bits of flesh off of bone. The canine is obviously really powerful and used for holding down prey, biting into uh, spinal cords or even windpipes. It's that carnassial shear on the side over there the ability for those teeth to act like a pair of scissors 
to actually shear flesh away from the bone that they can actually then put into manageable chunks to then swallow. And remember, a carnivore, its jaws move up and down. They don't move side to side, so they don't have any grinding surfaces on their teeth. So what we do have in carnivores is this attachment of the temporalis muscle. And remember I said the difference between carnivores and herbivores is the herbivores have that large masseter muscle which allow the lateral sideways movement, whereas the temporalis muscle, which attaches up over here and through the zygomatic arch, is your muscle attachment that allows for a very strong downward force. And the last guy we're going to look at today is, I suppose, the army tank, the, the battering ram of skulls. And this over here is an African buffalo. And you can see just how massive this boss is at the front over here. It's battering ram. And this bone all the way at the top of the skull is there to protect the brain underneath, but to provide as much weight for the battering ram as possible. This buffalo is really formidable. Let's have a look, turn him over a little bit. The weight of the skull is phenomenal. Now unfortunately this is a really old skull. It was lying in the bush for a long time before we found it. Uh, so it is missing the, the lower jaw, the mandible, and obviously all of those teeth. But you can see there is a couple of molars at the back over here. And again, those molars with all of the muscle attachments would give it the ability to move sideways and grind up that vegetation. So this would definitely be able to tell the difference between male and a female. In a lot of other animals, you can't really always tell the difference between male and female unless there's sexual dimorphism structurally between the male and females. In this case, buffaloes, the males have a much, much bigger and heavier boss because they do all the fighting. So their horns are bigger, their boss is thicker, and much, much heavier. Females, much, uh, much smaller horns. So if we look at these horns over here, they differ from those of deer in that these guys have a bony growth point underneath and it actually comes through the horn and then the keratin sheath is over that. So if we were to take this keratin sheath off, you would actually see uh, quite a large growth point of bone underneath that. So these guys, they don't shed their uh, horns as in deers shed their antlers. These horns are permanent. If they do break, wear down, they don't regrow them. And we can obviously see the eye orbits on the side of this animal's head, whereas the predators we've been looking at on the front. Well, I hope you enjoyed that session, looking at a few adaptations that some of our characteristic animals have. There's still so many different animals and skulls out there, and I'm sure we're going to touch on this again in the future. But until then, stay safe, and we hope to see you soon. Hello, everyone. My name's Andrew Kearney. I'm the Ranger Manager at Shamari Private Game Reserve. I just want to take a moment to say thank you very much for all the support and feedback that we've been getting on our brand new channel, Shamari TV. If you haven't followed us yet, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you right here at Shamori Private Game Reserve.